Yeah, get our YouTube. Hope everyone's doing well out there and um, everyone's living well in these days that are all falling apart and we're all keeping confident and keeping our energies balanced and we're all remaining strong. Um, so, as promised, here is the next chapter to the book that I wrote that was called A Story of Protection or Enslavement. And uh, I'll continue where we're up to, which is chapter two, which is uh, the website Mystery Man. All right. I slept like a baby that night. It must have been the constant adrenaline or the, the exhaustion of the day. But after my head hit that pillow, I was knocked out cold. Speaking of knocked out, bruising around my cheek had fully become surface from when the officer at the CCD assaulted me. The next morning, I awoke to the sound of the neighbours yelling. Kath and Ray yelling at the top of their heads about their financial problems. I opened the window and yelled, Knock it off, it's too early, Ray. Ray yelled back, Go fuck yourself, David. And I was just about to get my daily clothes on and go and confront Ray when in a... The far right corner of my eye, I caught a black, slow-moving square silhouette. The morning sun blocked it from being seen directly. The shadow moved closer, passing through the sun, blocking my vision. My eyes focused in. It was the same black matte vehicles that I had seen in the convoy. This was a solo one, but the armoured military-looking police officers stood on the side of the rails as one drove. These had markings of IFMA, the ar armoured van moved up the street and turned into Ray's house. I ducked down behind the window frame and moved into the laundry to where I could watch Ray's driveway inconspicuously through a small portico shaped window. The men jumped to the ground. This is it. I watched as a large man, a large man gets out from the vehicle and approaches Ray's door and knocks. The two large thumbs shook the door vibrating the framework. The two large thumb. Oh, the two large thumps shook the door, vibrating the framework. Ifma, open the door. Before Ray could answer, the other men had approached the door with a small battering ram and wedged the door, smashing it open. The glass works inside the frame. The uh, officer throws in a flashbang. I think it was. Well, it was a loud, a loud bang, and uh, you could see the flash through the windows of Ray's, and the officers could be heard yelling. The noise dulled to nothing and then the officers emerged one by one one had Ray in handcuffs his face was bleeding badly from around his eye socket the next had his wife locked in handcuffs escorting them to the armoured car the car reversed as the officers climbed back up onto the railings and it descended down my street yeah sorry about that actually lost the place and the music in the background went into an ad <laughs> so a loud bang and you could hear the flashbang through the windows of Ray's officers could be heard yelling. The noise dulled to nothing then the officers emerged one by one. One had Ray in handcuffs, his face was bleeding badly from around his eye socket. The next had his wife locked in cuffs escorting them to the armoured car. The car reversed as the officers climbed back up onto the railings and then descended down my street into the horizon. Today. I was determined to get hold of my camera crew and start the idea of the movie I was going to call Grey Fate. The grey being the white of the politicians and the black being the cold darkness of the newly enforced homeland security and the actions towards us civilians that they have shown me recently. My curious nature had once again inflated my adrenaline and I rushed back to the door, op opened it and darted across the backyard and scaled the fence to raise property. I moved towards the back door. It was one of the, it was one of those old rusted fly screen doors flapping in the wind, with a slowly decaying wooden door peeling paint falling from around it. I pushed against the door. It was locked. I thought, well, the front door is no longer there. Do I dare just enter, where I can be seen by everyone? As I snuck around, slowly creeping along the wall and quickly rushed into the front door, I could hear my phone ringing next door. I decided to answer it later and I moved up into Ray's living room. Nothing surprising, a few old pizza boxes, some weed on the table in a bowl and a collection of old news articles in a pile. Nothing out of the normal in the headlines consisted, I mean nothing out of the normal in the headlines consisted of cats that had been rescued by the fire department. But, 
Oh, sorry, nothing of the normal. The headlines consisted of cats that had been rescued by the fire department. Must have been cats, I thought to myself. I looked further into the house and I opened a bedroom door. Blood stained the bed. Blood stained the the bedroom door. Blood stained the bed quilt. In the corner of the room was a small, older IBM computer linked to a website called the True Patriots. No. I heard about the TBK website but never thought that I'd seen it since it was hidden on the dark web. I read the first few articles. The Enslavement Plan. It talked of an ancient society that was against all teaching of God. It talked how they had influenced their religion through secrecy and occult means, placing agents into all forms of society and then supporting them to gain positions of power. It went on with a quote from one of the groups themselves. It's better to control the shepherd than the sheep it enforces the true doctrine. It gave the group a name, the respected knights of the true cross of the illuminated ones. The illuminated ones? This has to be the group that Parrot was talking about, the sect of Seth. I heard as I lifted up the car door slam. I heard as I lifted up a car door slam. I walked to the front and walked outside. In my driveway now, there was a black slender limousine. I hadn't ordered anyone and no one I know has one, so why is it there? I walked out further towards the car. I could see a man standing in a suit by my door ringing the bell. Mr. Carlton, are you in? He kept ringing and ringing and asking. Hi, I'm Mr. Carlton. How can I help you, bud? He just turned around and he just turned around the other car's door slammed behind me. I watched as suited men walk towards me. I felt a black cloth being forced over my head and then a large blow to the back of the head. I must have remained unconscious for hours. I woke up on a private jet. The waitress were, the, the waitresses there were topless and the plain seat rows remained to seem empty apart from me and what I could see. I focused back to the reality and dazed and very confused. I went to move my hands. I couldn't. They had been binded to my chair. My legs the same. I started to yell help. What is going on? Help me, help me. What is going on? One of the waitresses approached me. She was German or Dutch. I couldn't make the accent, but she kept saying something, then pushed the mobile phone against my ear. Hello, Mr. Crowden. My name is, let's just say, Mr. X. I know that you have been looking for Mr. William Parrott. I can help you if you can help me. I said angrily back, who are you and what do you want with me? The man replied with, I assure you I mean no harm. I want to help you find Mr. Parrott. In fact, I have Mr. Parrott. What? Why am I here? What are you doing this to me for? Well, Mr. Crowden, we of the Fellowship don't take kindly to meddlers. We of the sect of Seth watch everything, and lately you have been brought into our attention too many times to account for. What do you, what do you seek, Mr. Crowden? Answered without hesitation, I want to know what's happening with Mr. William Parrott. He's been looked after, is all you need to know. Would you like to see him? I answered hesitatingly back, yes, I said loudly. Very well, the voice replied, then the phone went dead. The waitress approached again, smiling and untying me from my chair, my arms and then my legs. Come, she said, I heard it as clear as day. It must have been with the foreign accent that had broken English and broken English, but I lifted myself out of the chair. She reached out and took my hand and led me to the curtain at the end of at the end she removed the curtain and a blood drenched limber body of a mr parrot hung there still alive his legs bruised and battered and his clothes showed signs of torture the waitress reaches up and grabs his mouth and opens it my stomach rolled over itself and tied into knots his mouth had no tongue his stub from where they had removed his tongue remained bleeding Life was still in his eyes, but his body was failing, falling and failing from the bleeding out. The woman advances to me again and slides her hand down into her skirt and removes a bit of paper and passes it to me. The note said, stop this or this will happen to you. All I remember after that is someone behind me pulling me back to the seat and holding my eyelids open as the waitress walked towards me, uh, towards Mr. Parrott and inserted a kitchen knife into the side of his neck and slowly slides away, 
right across his throat, his mouth gargling blood and his body falling limp, and then blackness again. I woke up in the street next to my house. My head hurt, and I had a large lump sticking out the back of my skull, not knowing, not going to lie, it hurt. Despite the pain, I once again lifted myself and walked back towards my house, entering the driveway. I could see police tape, do not cross, all over the entrance and the side windows to Ray's house. The door had been blocked off and one lone officer stood guard by the door. Normal closed with his squad car parked up on the verge in front of Ray's house. I walked up my driveway while passing the letterbox. Strange, that red sticker was back and the, red, the small red dot that I had been placed in almost the exact same place that I had peeled it from. Again, I reached down to remove it. The, the, the stick, I, I reached down to remove the sticker when my eyes met with the officers as my arms reached down to the letterbox. The officer began to get more fidgety and then he called out, move away from that, please. That is government official business. I asked, what, it is there, what is it there for? He said, each district has its own stickers, either placed on a letterbox or a verge. He went on to say it's for Homeland Security drill exercises, and it was now a federal crime to remove the sticker without the proper author author authorization. I looked back, drills? What kind of drills? Or oh, nothing to worry about, citizen. It's just precautions to keep us all safe from now the war of terror that is threatening our freedom. Better to be safe than sorry, right? I said questionably, right. He then turned and proceeded back to Ray's porch and started guarding the front door again. I went inside and straight to the TV. I put on the news again. The same story repeated day in and day out. I decided I should hold off on the film for now. To admit too many occurrences that had happened in my life had been flipped around in two days. I really wanted to know what new laws had been passed. I ignored the news for too long. I opened up Frugal and typed our new laws of the war on terrorism. The search engine listed so many conspiracy websites, but then I come across the government official state and boundary laws in act of fight and terrorism. The document read as follows. Due to the overwhelming attack in our homeland, soil liberties will have to take a stand on the side for now. It went on a bit with governmental propaganda, but when I got to the executive orders our president had signed, my head dropped, and my heart too. The orders went like this. 1. People must not amass in more than three. If anyone is caught doing this, they will be forced to be open to the police actions. These actions are classified. 2. In the event of a terror attack, the constitution will be suspended of the right now. We have partly suspended the Constitution, but if more attacks are made, more constitutional sacrifices must be called for order. 3. All private land and personal resources will be removed from what that set individual for the purpose of our Nation and Homeland Security Protection Act. 4. Any websites that are forbidden to view out your local or state government if viewed and result with federal detainment un until those set individuals are proven innocent. 5. All police must be upgraded in battlefield tactics as well as homegrown terrorism tactics. All federal police must have fully upgraded up-to-date military gear to protect the people and its interests. All citizens are to receive a mark if the constitution becomes fully suspended due to the threat and the war on terror. Please remember, this is for your own safety. Obey peacefully to help better yourself and our great nation. This was what was passed in two days these laws are insane our forefathers fought for our rights and made it made the constitution to make sure that these kind of laws could never pass i knew our constitution well well dad dad well my dad he's passed now but he was a strong patriot he made me recite the recite the whole entire constitution before i was 13 i knew how to load and assemble an assault rifle by 14 so this was my natural way of thinking. I always ignored Dad when he ranted on about troops in our streets and martial law taking over domestic and foreign governments. I seemed to It seemed to be so unrealistic to me at the time, but who would have thought that in that one hour our future of our lives could change forever? My phone buzzed and I looked down unknowingly. Unknown caller. Strange, I answered. You seem to want to know more, my friend. I want to help you. My name is Phil, Phil Schneider. Can we meet? I answered yes. Very 
leaders. Phil Schneider, can we meet? Oh, Schneider, sorry. Phil Schneider, can we meet? I answered yes. I would like to know what you know, and I will be armed. My last meeting with someone turned out not so good. Understandable. I will send you the time and the place. Come alone and watch your sides. Eyes are everywhere. After you get this message, I want you to go to your mailbox and open it. Don't worry about the guard. He's, um, sleeping, the voice giggled. I walked out the front towards the letterbox and opened it. Inside was an envelope and an upside-down triangle with an eye in the middle with no smoking red circle stamped over the top. Open it, open it, it read on the front. Before reading the envelope, I glanced to see where the guard was. Sure enough, the guard was laying down flat on the porch. I'm not sure if he was sleeping or dead. But the way things were, I wasn't going to the... But the way things were... Sorry, I just got lost where I was. <laughs> On the porch, not sure if he was sleeping or dead. But the way things were going, I didn't really want to find out. I opened up the envelope. It said, National Park, 3.30am. I looked at the time. It was 9pm. I had hours to cross town and to reach the destination. I rang the taxi service and asked for a taxi from my house to the park. The operator said, one is in the area, my wait should not be long. I stood by the mailbox waiting anxious to get going and the taxi light could be seen in the coming closer. It pulled into my driveway, I watched as the headlights trailed a beam of light across Ray's house. As we reversed out the driveway, I couldn't help but wonder if the cab driver had seen the officer dead. Or, or out cold at Ray's. The taxi turned to the left. Hey, we're supposed to be going to the right. The Middle Eastern man looked Middle East. Uh, look, the middle. The the man looked Middle Eastern, but spoke with a strong American accent. No, no, this is the quicker way. Just a quicker way. Sit back, you relax. My phone buzzed again. The message said, "That's not a taxi. Get out." I knew that the taxi driver had no idea about the pistol I had tucked securely in my jacket. I had grabbed by the, after the mystery man Phil had requested this meeting. I asked again, you're going the wrong way, turn around. The man said, no, no, this is right. Without thinking, I put my gun to the back of his head and demanded him to tell me who he is and to answer. Was I, uh, he said, okay, okay, you got me, mister, you got me. I said, okay, explain. And I pushed the gun harder to the back of his skull. He said, chill dude, we were hired by some men to come and pick you up, that's all I know. Where are you taking me? I don't know, but look at the dash, it has its GPS pre-programmed. I'm just supposed to take you there. I told the man to get the fuck out of the car, demanding it loud. He shook with fear and, and stopped the car to a halt, opening the door and sprinted straight across the road into an oncoming semi-trailer. His body basically disintegrated before my very eyes. The bones just pulverized and a dead limp flattered carcass on the man of the man is all that remained. I heard a woman call, call, call the police. I jumped out from the back and into the front seat and pushed down the accelerator. I pushed the GPS to see where I was going. Reed Bank, it's a Reed, Reed, uh, Reed Blank, it's the taxi driver was lying. Eh? But hold up. The GPS read blank. It's like the taxi driver was lying. I collected my thoughts and drove down the lonely freeways. Not many people were out at this time, apart from the law enforcement that had the dealings that had been having with them lately reassured me I didn't want to encounter any of them, any any of the way to meet with Phil. Uh, sorry, yeah, I didn't want to count any of them along the way to meet Phil. I drove and drove, passing roadblocks and small checkpoints. By taking slight detours, it felt like I was in no man's land, so desolate and abnormally quiet. I could see Black Hawk helicopters in the distance. I'd never seen so many in one group. I parked the car up for 20 minutes in a gas station, ducking down as I watched the choppers fly overhead and towards my home's direction. I pulled back out into the, into the road again and began my journey again. It was 40 minutes to 3.30. I had to speed up my pace. I had to make sure to meet Phil. I pushed harder at the accelerator, gaining more and more speed. I must have flew the last hundred kilometers because when I got to the park, the time was only 3.10 a.m. 
I decided I would look around a bit before meeting meet the, my meeting time with Phil, this mysterious stranger. The park was wildlife. Park animals wandered freely inside. The gates and the trees seemed to be well preserved. A giant sign stood out at the entrance, EFMA controlled area, sanctioned property by the United Nations. I tried to ignore it and just move on. I watched as the minutes pushed by, looking over my shoulder every few seconds, making sure I wasn't being watched. It got to about 3.29 when a car pulled up to the park's entrance. The lights, the headlights flashed a few times and the car then proceeded to creep towards me. The car then pulled into the, pulled up to my side and the window then rolled down. There was an elderly grey-haired man, chubby and losing his hair, not completely bald but losing it nonetheless. He said, get in. I nodded and I op and opened the car's door and sat in the passenger seat. He said, sit back, we got quite a ride. When we get there, I'll tell you everything. I placed my head back against what felt to be a soft seat backings. I drifted to sleep again. Who could blame me? My life was becoming exhausting. I dreamt I was inside of a giant machine and everything that we knew was wrong. These cameras kept watching me. I ran by every direction I faced, there was a camera watching me. The cameras got bigger and bigger like they had been inflating and then started to crush me. I woke up from it like a dream as if you were falling, but I was awake, but awake. Phil had turned the radio on, some oldie song was playing. I listened to the lyrics as I watched the roads cat's eyes go under us and pass us by. We came to an old farm, it was out in the sticks, hidden away behind trees, lost to the wilderness. Phil said, okay, here, and uh, up, upsy daisy, out we go. I thought to myself, what a strange man, but that didn't stop me from getting out and following him. I walked, uh, following him. He walked to the front door and waved some hand signals. The door then clicked and clanked as if someone on the other side could be heard undoing a lot of safety latches. The door creaked open and two people stood there, a young boy and an elderly woman. They said, enter, and enter quick. I made my way in single profile behind Phil through the door. The same symbol on the letter in the mailbox was plastered over the wall's giant posters of it. The World Revolution. I walked down three or four corridors before coming to a stop. The elderly woman approached me. Do you have a cell phone? I replied, yes, it's right here. I lifted up my arm. I lifted my arm out holding my new model Z phone, smartphone. She took it from me and opened the back. She removed the SIM card and asked if there's any information or contacts that I'd need. I knew most of the information I needed was at home. I could always retrieve it. I said no. Then she lifted and smashed the. She lifted the SIM card up and rubbed a strange-looking magnet against it. In it, the card's microchips. Blah, 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 blah. Against it, the card's microchips decayed the circuit board and become soft and flexible. Then she inserted it into a metal box. It's okay now. Now we can enter. No eyes to see you anymore, Mr. Carlton. She pushed a glowing red light on the wall. A rumble could be felt. The floor and the neighbouring foundation. The wall to the right folded back and a room covered with all kinds of notes and articles had been pinned to the wall. It looked like a madman's paradise conspiracy magazine piled into all tall stacks of pictures of alleged real UFO sightings, Bigfoot, but one was clean and it had new photos on it. It looked closer at the photos. I spotted Mr. Parrott, what looked to be him definitely. He was surrounded with dead Vietnam men and women's heads and bodies scattered all around him. He stood blood soaked with his machete dripping, the blood from the 300 that he had just slaughtered. This was true? Mr. Parrott really was wanted for these crimes? Phil must have seen something in my facial expression. He put my hand on my shoulder and said, it's not true. He killed those people, yes, but he was not himself at that time. That answer is of no big that, that answer is a big no, my friend. Come, I will explain. William was, br was a bright young man, striving for achievements. He joined his local army reserves and he practiced day in and out and wanted to be the best at soldier that he could and that was possibly going to be. His achievements granted him the acknowledgments, acknowledgments within ranks and his story of his marksmanship spread like fire throughout the like dried up wheat. 
The higher officials took notice and recommended him for training program. The, they confronted him and made the proposition they wanted him to join a secret spy program run by the Agency Central Intelligence, the ACI. This group was clandestine. They worked in locked labs behind the most highest security walls. The programs were to take subjects that preceded excellence in the area of warfare and subdue the mind, blanket, and then reprogram it from nothing. The program was called KM Sultra. The KM was the abbreviation for the killing mind, the killing mind, and the Sultra was the programming technique. It was a sort of abbreviation they made for the original project Operation Butterfly program. The idea was to split the subject's personality to two or more or three could remain inside of what and be called to will at any future at any time using trigger words that a handler had embedded into the subject's subconscious. The original personality would become an alternate personality even though the subject remained the same in actions, the personality being portrayed would be blank meaning it was a fake persona that looked like the subject but it was not as they could uh, it, you know, but it was not they could answer things about their past they knew the people that they used to know but the personality was a hijack of the subject's natural form of life experience wow i didn't even realize i wrote that all the way back then that kind of blew me away because that's fucking yeah <laughs> okay Hold on, so you mean to say that William was one of these program people? I met him on the street. He seemed to be scattered, but things that he says were seemed like he was more trying to say something rather than hide it. Are you saying he, at that time, was one of these blank personas? Good observation. To, to answer bluntly, no, he was not blank. Let me continue and everything will come to light. I promise. Now, where was I? Oh, okay. So, Mr. Parrot was taken, taken, taken by the ACI and inserted into the KM Sultra program. He endured many different kinds of psychological and physiological tortures and abuse. For months he was locked away and tortured with electrodes, beaten, raped, and programmed. a program called the Monarch Program was used and embedded into the KM Sultra training. Training? You gotta be kidding me, they called that training? Yes, Mr. Crowden. Training is what it was called. Anyway, tra the, the, it, was call it was called and still is called. Shall I continue? Yes, please do. This is fascinating to me. So the training continued for months. The day and the night, they broke him down to nothing, then started to re-educate him. Or should we just really say reprogram his subconscious mind to see that the conscious doesn't need to be controlled. It's the subconscious that the consciousness listens to. Implanting a message into the subconscious automatically allows the bypass of the conscious making you able to control the actions of a subject in the future using a simple trigger that they implant into the sub. You know what I mean now on, so to make the story shorter I'm going to refer to the subconscious as sub. So back to the story, Mr. Parrot's history. So. As he endured such tortures and he was, he was become a broken man, they then rebuilt him. No one could tell the difference. He seemed like normal attitude towards being a soldier, normal appearance in his attributes, and uh, he was more focused. He was, he was recruited by the US government when the Vietnam War broke out. He was a private mercenary for hire and listed at the top end when it come down to getting things done. They assigned him orders and he was told to go to Laos and Vietnam and wait for the further instructions. The days went by as the agency prepared him for the task ahead. The orders come in as he was to execute the entire area of the population, men and women, young or old. He was shocked as the orders and refused it at first, but then they had William's handler come and whisper into his ear. and He immediately jumped up and grabbed the machete from the wall and rushed the door to door slaughtering the Asian natives, showing no remorse to anything that he was doing. He dissembled and decapitated and mutilated the entire population. In the centre square he stopped. The agency still does not know what happened to this day, but he awoke screaming. Pictures emerged of this tragedy not so long after, but they had images that had been doctored bodies showing all around him like he had massacred the entire 300 right there. The sad fact is... The whole charade was to cover up the 
cover up a plan by the illuminated ones to depopulate the area for use as export import hub for the military industrial complex they wanted a base and they wanted a war but they wanted a wanted normal playoff of each sides now what they had was a excuse to move in and gather the troops and started to, and evacuated them to the location where the crazed american slaughters the entire population of 300 in a small village hit by the head bit hit by the headlines william vanished not so long after he had escaped the aci vanished too until three weeks ago he emerged again at this time he had somehow deprogrammed himself of the psychological programming and was incom the or, or the psychological program was incomplete but thought to have been finished anyway he repeated and re he, re he reappeared is this the main thing we want to look at here he made a video on two blue where we were warning the about the world about a global plan takeover he talked about this group the illuminated ones he said that they were satanic at heart and they desired nothing more than the power and control the house vibrated and the nearby vase from the desk the black hawk everyone black hawk be quiet be quiet i watched as the young boy run to the room flicking each of the light switches off we all huddled against the wall and the thunder of the helicopter crossed across the house you could hear the whisping of the blades leaving into the distance about uh, about after sitting huddled in the corner for a while making sure that the coast was clear i asked are we good now phil was shaking i know the military had startled some extreme measures towards us as a mass but i was really shaken but he was really shaken i asked phil what's wrong are you all right he replied i thought they were coming for me i thought they had found me i asked you never you never told me how you found me we didn't find you, Mr. Crowden. You found us. We tracked the trace of the user of the website that we had, the Matrix-style ad. We wanted people that were awake to see it. We wanted you for. We watched you for a few weeks and then understand you want to make things right. This is why you are here, and that is why I'm speaking to you. But who are you, Phil? And that's where that chapter ends. And the next chapter that I'll put up um, is. Uh, Chapter 3, The Story of the Rogue Informer. So um, I hope you've enjoyed it. That is Chapter 2, just like I said of my book, that is copyright to me. And um, uh, the, the actual title of the book is called The Story of Protection or Enslavement. So peace, love and respect all. And um, I hope this just allows you to sit back and uh, listen to a scenario of what could take place just if we don't do the right thing in the world. And... Uh, it, it's a message that's written right in this book that's trying to give people the true understanding of how the world works and what really goes on when you read right through it and see through all of those facades that we have put in front of us to actually say something's one way when it's another. So, um, peace, love, and respect, like I said, and I'll get back to you another time. Um, keep safe out there, keep your hygiene, and remember to always balance your energies and keep hold of yourself and keep in contact with your spirit and keep in connection to the source and everything will be all right for you no matter what goes down. All right, peace, love, and respect.